So good morning, students. Once again, welcome to the uh, class on the law of C. This is the third session with you. And uh, um, we have completed uh, two chapters uh, so far. But before we move further, a word of caution or advice, however you'd like to take it, just pay attention for this class, um, you know, because uh, certain concepts are quite difficult, but what we are going to discuss for this class. And well, if you don't, this will just seem like a chunk of information just thrown at you. But if you pay attention, I assure you that you will do well. Uh, so, so far, we have completed two chapters, as I said earlier. One is, of course, the introductory part of it. And we went through how the law of the sea evolved over the years. We, you know, touched upon certain aspects of history. And then we studied in the second chapter certain marine concepts, such as the territorial waters, economic zone, high seas, and so on. Today, we are going to delve deeper into the concept of high sea. That is, uh, you know, where we studied even during the last class. But today we are going to touch upon that aspect of ice, high seas, a little bit more deeper. And that is, uh, we are going to learn it in the UNCLOS perspective. That is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea perspective. Now, before that, of course, we are going to explore this topic that you can see right here on the screen. We're going to study the meaning of the freedom of navigation, right? So what is this freedom of navigation? Now, freedom of navigation is an indispensable part of the law of sea. It is something that is having close nexus to the law of the sea. It is connected to the law of sea. And it is a kind of a foundation stone of law of the sea. Because one of the purposes of the law of the sea is to ensure peaceful navigation. Yeah. So the merriam Webster's dictionary defines the freedom of navigation as the right recognized under the international law, especially by treaties or agreements for vessels of one or all states to navigate streams passing through two or more states. Now, there was a famous case way back in 1934, and this is an important case that you must cite in your answer books for your examination. This is the Oscar Chin case, and the citation is Britain versus Belgium, 1934, PCJ. And uh, the Permanent Court of Justice, that is PCJ, on December 12, 1934, defined freedom of navigation as freedom of movement for vessels, freedom to enter ports, and to make use of plant and docks to load and unload goods and to transport goods and passengers. There was a, a treatise by Dupuy and Wigness in 1991, where at page 836, they opined that freedom of navigation is that principle of the law of the sea that ships flying the flag of any sovereign state shall not suffer interference from other states, apart from the exceptions provided for in the international law. That means they're trying to say that the ships have the freedom to navigate through the high seas and their right of navigation, their freedom of navigation should not be hindered or should be unhindered. They've got that right. Well, then in uh, you know, Article 87 and Article 90 of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, this particular freedom of navigation was codified. Article 87 specifically states that under this clause, freedom of high seas, you know, that freedom that they explain is that high seas are open to all states, whether coastal or landlocked. That means freedom of the high sea is exercised under the conditions laid down by this convention, that is United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, and by other rules of international law, and that they are open to all states. OK, whether coastal or landlocked, that means it does not come within the territorial jurisdiction of any particular state. It is open to all coastal states, whether the coastal states, uh, whether they are coastal states or even landlocked jurisdictions. Now, it comprises inter alia both for coastal and landlocked states. 
that is the freedom of navigation is given to them, freedom of overflight, freedom to lay submarine cables and pipelines, which is subject to part six, and, and part six deals with continental shelf, freedom to construct artificial islands and other installations which is permitted under international law. And again, which is subject to article uh, or part six, that is which deals with continental shelf, freedom of fishing and freedom of scientific research. Now, these freedoms shall be exercised by all states. What are those freedoms? Freedom of navigation, freedom of fishing, freedom of laying pipelines, and so on. So these freedoms shall be exercised by all state parties, that is, by all nations, with due regard for the interests of other states or other nations in their exercise of the freedom of the high seas, and also with due regard for the rights under this convention with respect respect to activities in the area. So then Article 90 specifically touches upon the aspect of right of navigation, where it says, every state, whether coastal or landlocked, has the right to sail ships flying its flag on the high seas. This is an important article. Article 19 of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea states that every state, that means every nation, whether coastal or landlocked, has the right to sail ships flying its flag on the high sea. Now, international law of the sea evolved over the years, as we all know, and thereby it concretized the right of freedom of navigation, this freedom to move in the high sea or to sail over the high seas and not, not to be subject to the jurisdiction of any particular nation because all are free to use the high seas. Further, this right evolved with its operational ramifications that has led to the concept of freedom of navigation operations, and it's called as FNAPs. Now, which operation freedom is based on the sovereignty and interdependence of the state to enforce such a right? Now, suppose if there is uh, uh, any navigation of a particular ship is hindered by any other state party, so that state party has got the right to, you know, make a claim under the international laws saying that why are you you know hindering my right or why are you posing article uh, i mean obstacle in my freedom of navigation well so this is all about freedom of navigation this is quite a short chapter but freedom of navigation by and all is like the foundation stone of the law of the sea that is freedom to move about freely or to use the high seas freely to sail over the high seas by any nation for that matter. And of course, one of the purposes of the law of the sea is to ensure peaceful navigation. Next, let us now move on to, um, you know, the next chapter that is chapter four, that is quite a comprehensive chapter. So chapter four deals with high seas and how this, uh, you know, aspect is, uh, you know, enumerated in the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. Now, what is a high seas? We've already discussed in the previous two classes, but just, just going through the definition again. Miriam's Dictionary defines high sea as the open part of a sea or ocean, especially outside territorial waters. The free dictionary, F-R-E-E, -E, I'm repeating F-R-E-E, -E, the free dictionary defines high sea as the open waters of an ocean or a sea beyond the limits of the territorial jurisdiction of a country. Britannica defines high sea as in maritime law is all part of the mass of salt water surrounding the globe that are not part of territorial sea or internal waters of a state. Thereby, high seas are that portion of the open sea which are beyond the territorial waters or beyond the jurisdiction of any state. Now, let us go through some of the provisions, important provisions of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the sea, where they have specifically, you know, enumerated uh, or uh, ha where they have the articles pertaining to high seas. Chapter 7 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea deals with high seas. That apart, Article 65 also mentions about the management and conservation of marine mammals in the high sea. 
Now, Article 86. Article 86 specifically speaks about, uh, you know, uh, it, it uh, in a way it defines high seas and it says that it is all the parts of the sea that are not included in the exclusive economic zone in the territorial sea or in the internal waters of a state or in the archipelagic waters of any archipelagic state. So you could say that the United Nations Convention of, on the law of the sea defines the high seas under its article 86. The article 86 says that the high seas encompass or they include all parts of the sea that are not included in the exclusive economic zone of the EEZ or in the territorial sea or in the internal waters of a state or in the archipelagic waters of any archipelagic state. Next, Article 88 specifically entails peaceful use of the high seas to the extent that it emphasizes the need for the high seas to be reserved for peaceful use or to be used for peaceful purpose, right? Next is Article 87. We have spoken about Article 86, 88, and 89. Now we will talk about Article 87. Now, Article 87 of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea is a foundational article of Chapter 7, which deals with the freedom of high seas. Now, it states that the high seas are open to all states, whether coastal or landlocked. So freedom of the high seas exercised under the conditions laid down by this convention and by other rules of international law. It comprises inter alia both for coastal and landlocked states. It provides freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight, freedom to lay submarine cables and pipelines subject to part six, freedom to construct artificial islands and installations which are permitted under international law, freedom of fishing, freedom of scientific research. So these freedoms shall be exercised by all states with due regard for the interests of other states in their exercise of the freedom of the high seas and also with due regard for the rights under the convention with respect to activities in the area. So over the high seas, there is this particular freedom, these, you know, um, six set of freedoms that are provided under the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. They, got the, they, they give the freedom of navigation. That means it entitles a state or a nation to have the freedom of navigation, the freedom of overflight, freedom to lay submarine cables and pipelines, freedom to construct artificial islands, freedom of fishing, and freedom of scientific research. Now, Article 90 refers to the right of navigation. So every state, whether coastal or landlocked, has a right to sail ships flying its flag on the high sea. So this is what Article 90 specifically you know, states. Every state, that is every nation, whether coastal or landlocked, has a right to sail ships flying its flag on the high seas. Next, Article 91 deals with the nationality of ships. Now, every state shall fix the condition for the grant of its nationality to ships, for the registration of ships in its territory, and for the right to fly its flag. Ships have the nationality of the state whose flag they are entitled to fly. There must exist a genuine link between the state and the ship. Further, every state shall issue to ships to which it has granted the right to fly its flag documents to that effect. So what they're saying is, when ships are sailing over the high seas, they must have the flag of that particular nation to which the ship belongs. Apart from that, it should always carry all the relevant flag documents to that effect. Just like, for example, when you're driving a car, it is like, you know, mandatory to have your car documents in the car. Because anytime there is a kind of, uh, say, there is an inspection or you know, sometimes the, the police might, you know, intercept your 
your uh, no uh, your drive and then they may say okay just show me your documents your car documents so likewise even the ship while it's you know sailing over the high seas it must have its flag documents relevant and other relevant documents its flag documents that it belongs to so and so country and also it must have the flag of that particular nation to which it belongs now article 92 talks about the status of ships ships shall, shall sail under the flag of one state only you understand so it cannot have the flags of two uh, different states or two nations. It should have one flag. That means it should sail under the flag of one state, saying that it belongs to that particular state or a nation, except in circumstances, there are exceptions, where it is expressly provided for in international treaties or in this convention, that is the United Nations Convention Law of the Sea, that shall be subject to its exclusive jurisdiction on the high sea. Now, a ship may not change its flag during a voyage or while in a port of coal, except that is save in the case of a real transfer of ownership or change of registry. That means in case there is real transfer of ownership or there is change of registry, only in that circumstance, the ship might change its flag during a voyage. A ship which sails under the flags of two or more states using them according to convenience may not claim any of the nationalities in question with respect to any other state and may be assimilated to a ship without nationality. Now, Article 93 specifically talks about ships flying the flag of UNO. 92 talks about ships uh, you know, flying the flag of any particular nation. Now, 93 talks about ships flying the flag of UNO. Again, the same rules are applicable, even if they are, you know, it belongs, the, the ships belong to United Nations organization or any specialized agencies or international atomic energy agencies. They need to comply with the preceding provisions as well. Now, Article 94 talks about the duties of the flag state. Now, every state or every nation shall effectively exercise its jurisdiction and control in administrative, technical, and social matters over ships flying its flag. In particular, every state should maintain a register of ships containing the names, the details of the ship, and the, you know, the nation that the ship belongs to, the flag documents, and so on. Apart from that, it should also assume the jurisdiction under, under its international law over each ship flying its flag and its master, officers, crew in respect of administrative, technical, and social matters concerning the ship. That means the law that is applicable for the master, the officers, or crew in respect of any administrative, technical, or social matters concerning the ship is the local laws of that particular nation. However, the voyage itself, the ship as a whole, the voyage itself, when it's sailing over the high seas, it is subject to international laws. But for the purpose of the members of the crew, of administrative, technical, or social matters, the law that is applicable is the domestic law of that particular state. I hope this is clear. For the matters of administrative or technical purposes, I'm reiterating the law that is applicable is domestic law of the nation or domestic law of the state, state or nation. In international law, we refer to any nation or a country as a state. However, when it comes to sailing over the high seas, just the matter of the voyage, when it concerns about the voyage and you know sailing over the high seas, overall, the, the, the jurisdiction or the laws that are applicable is international laws or it is brought under the, you know, because those they are flying over the high seas or international waters, or they're sailing over the high seas or international waters. So the law that is applicable is international law, or specifically the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and other international treaties, whichever are applicable. Now, every state shall take such measures for ships flying its flag as are necessary to ensure safety at sea with regard to the construction equipment, seaworthiness of ships, the manning of ships, labor conditions, training of crews, the use of signals, maintenance of communications, and the prevention of collisions. So that means the nation 
every nation or to whom the ship belongs, whoever is a concerned or relevant authority, they have to take care of these factors. It is the the, the ship is you know seaworthy and the construction and equipments of the ship is you know perfect and the manning of the ship or the labor or the crew members are all well trained as per you know as per the guidelines that are provided in the international instruments and the use of the signals maintenance of communication and you know should be taken care of why so as to prevent collisions or accidents next such measures shall include those necessary to ensure that each ship before registration and thereafter at appropriate level is surveyed by a qualified surveyor of ships and has on board such charts, nautical publications and navigation equipment and instruments as are appropriate for the safe navigation of the ship. Yet another measure is that each ship is in charge of a master and officers who possesses or who possess appropriate qualifications, in particular in seamanship, navigation, communication, and marine engineering, and that the crew is appropriate in qualification and the numbers for the type, size, missionary, and equipment for the ship. Now, further that the master, officers, and to the extent appropriate, the crew are fully conversant with and are required to observe the applicable international regulations concerning the safety of life at sea, the prevention of collisions, the prevention, reduction, and control of marine population, and the maintenance of communication by radio. Apart from that, in taking measures called for in paragraph three that we have discussed earlier and four of each state, it's required to conform to generally accepted international regulations, procedures, and practices, and to take any steps which may be necessary to secure their observance. That means the measure should be uh, in consonance with international regulations, in conformity or in consonance with the various international regulations, procedures, and practices um, you know, and they must take steps which may be necessary to secure their observance. Further, a state which has clear grounds to believe that proper jurisdiction and control with respect to a ship have not been exercised may report the facts to the flag state. Okay, now upon receiving such a report, the flag state that is to whom the ship belongs, the flag state, shall investigate the matter and if appropriate, may take any action necessary to remedy the situation. Now, each state shall cause an inquiry to be held by or before a suitably qualified person or persons into every marine casualty. Now, what happens in case of marine accidents or marine casualty or any incidents that take place during the navigation on the high seas, which involves a ship flying its flag and causing loss of life or serious injury to nationals of another state or serious damage to ships or installations of another state or to marine environment. The flag state then and the other state shall cooperate in the conduct of any inquiry held by that other state into such marine casualty or incident of navigation. So the state, uh, the, the flag state as well as the other state, they cooperate you know, to conduct the inquiry in case of any marine casualty or incident of navigation. Article 95 talks about immunity of warships on the high seas, that they are guaranteed as against the jurisdiction of any other state other than the flag state. Now, this specifically talks about warships and that their, immune, their immunity is guaranteed as against the jurisdiction of any other states other than the flag state or other than the state to whom the ship belongs. Now ships, now article 96 talks about ships that are used for government or non-commercial service. Now ships owned or operated by any country or by a state and used only on government non-commercial service shall on the high seas have complete immunity from the jurisdiction of any state other than the flag state. That means any other state other than the flag state, you know, cannot exercise jurisdiction over that particular vessel or cannot have its rights over that particular vessel. 
that is sailing, that belongs to a particular coastal state or a flag state or the flag state that means, uh, you know, uh, the state to which the flag belongs, which is flying over the ship. So Article 97 then speaks about the penal jurisdictions in matters of collision or accident or any other incident of navigation. And this again is a very important article. What happens in case of collision or any other accident or incident of navigation? In the event of collision or any other incident of navigation concerning a ship on the high seas, involving the penal or disciplinary responsibility of the master or of any other person in the service of the ship, no penal or disciplinary proceedings may be instituted against such a person except before the judicial or administrative authorities, either of the flag state or of the state of which such person is a national. Now, for example, what happens if the captain, example, what happens if the captain of the ship, you know, commits a wrong or commits, uh, you know, there, there is a default on his part or there, there, he has not exercised, you know, proper uh, reasoning and he has not exercised his, uh, you know, tasks that is assigned to him properly. And as a result of it, there is a particular collision or there is an incident that has taken place as a result of uh, him not being alert. So what happens? So he is held responsible. So now who is held responsible? It is a captain. Now suppose a captain is held responsible. So where would the, where would the you know, case go? So it cannot be a, a proceeding of a, a, a penal or a disciplinary proceeding cannot be instituted in any other state, but in the flag state or in a state or the nation to which that particular person is a national. Now, in disciplinary matters, the state which has issued a master's certificate or a certificate of competence or license shall alone be competent after due legal process to pronounce the withdrawal of such certificates, even if the holder is not a national of the state which issued them. Now, the question here is, in case he has committed a wrong, which is so grave that would necessitate the cancellation of his license. So then what happens? So such matters of cancellation of license can be done only by the appropriate authority who has issued the license. And in the state or a country where the license is issued, Right. Further, no arrest or detention of ship, even as a measure of investigation, shall be ordered by any authorities other than those of the flag state. Now, under ordinary circumstances, ships that are that are you know sailing over the high seas cannot be arrested or detained, even for the matter of investigation, unless it is ordered by the flag state. Now, Article ninety eight talks about the duty to render assistance. Before we move further, in case we get disconnected, please join back. Now, Article 98 talks about the duty to render assistance. Every state shall require the master of a ship flying its flag in so far as he can do so without serious danger to the ship, the crew or the passengers to render assistance to any person found at the sea in danger of being lost. That means they are allowed to, you know, support or assist any other ship that is in danger, even danger of being lost, or to proceed with all possible speed to the rescue of a person in distress. If informed of their need of assistance in so far as such action may reasonably be expected of him, that means under all reasonable circumstances, in case it is possible for a ship to go to the rescue of some other ship, say, for example, who has had a collision or is in the fear of, you know, drowning. So just they can go and support the, you know, the crew members or whoever is on board the other ship, which has, uh, which has, which is ill-fated and has the fear of drowning or there is some problem because of which the, you know, the ship is stranded, for example. So the ship that is sailing 
has got the duty to render assistance to that particular ship and its uh, you know those who are on board the ship and go and rescue those people in distress so after a collision to in case there is a collision again to render assistance to the other ship its crew and passengers and where possible to inform the other ship of the name of its own ship its port of registry and the nearest port at which it will call now every coastal state shall promote the establishment operation and maintenance of an adequate and effective search and rescue services regarding safety on and over the sea and where circumstances so require by way of mutual regional arrangements cooperate with neighboring states for this purpose now article 99 talks about prohibition of slave transport or slave trade Every state, every country shall take effective measures to prevent and punish the transportation of slaves in ships authorized to fly its flag and to prevent the unlawful use of its flag for that purpose. So any slave taking refuge on board any ship, whatever its flag, shall ipso facto be free. In case they see a slave, then they will set the slave free. In fact, today slaves are not permitted. It is considered as illegal slave trade is again a huge international crime in fact so article 109 it's you know it's, it goes in violation of human rights as well of course so today slave trade is abolished in fact it's not permitted it's abolished and in case somebody does that so there will be severe consequences and uh, they will be held against the relevant international laws as well as, uh, you know, it would also be considered as human rights violation. Next, Article 109 or 109 talks about unauthorized broadcasting from the high sea. Now, all states shall cooperate in the suppression of unauthorized broadcasting from the high seas. That means broadcasting from the high sea is not permitted uh, that is authorized broadcasting is permitted but not unauthorized broadcasting for the purpose of this convention unauthorized broadcasting means the transmission of sound radio or television broadcast from a ship or installation on the high seas intended for reception by the general public contrary to the international regulations but excluding the transmission of distress calls. Any person engaged in unauthorized broadcasting may be prosecuted before the court of the flag state, that is to, to whom the ship belongs, the state of registry of the installation, the state of which the person is a national, that is the country to which he belongs, any state where the transmissions can be received, or any state where authorized radio communication is suffering interference. So on the high seas, a state having jurisdiction in accordance